and welcome to Bodyholic with D, episode number 25. My name is Dee Katz Shachar and I am a public health promoter. I hold an MPH from Tel Aviv University on the research track and I'm a fitness trainer with well over 17 years of experience and I hold specializations in corrective exercise, women's fitness, and Pilates. I'm also the founder and trainer of Bodyholic, the global health and fitness platform and community, and I'm the author of the book, Rip It Up for Good. This podcast is a part of my effort and mission as a public health professional because I believe that real science-based information and knowledge is power, and my job in this life is to empower you. I want you to have high and sustained energy throughout the day, and I want you to feel better than you have ever felt before, during, and after your workouts, in and out of your clothing, and not only physically, but mentally and emotionally as well. Today is the second time I have the awesome opportunity to host Carl Sterling. We discuss very specific intervention strategies for managing Parkinson's disease and additional movement disorders in today's episode. And I just have to make a little bit of a side note. We can all benefit from the strategies that Carl discusses. Just to recap, Carl Sterling is a neuro rehabilitation specialist and NASM master trainer based in Syracuse, New York, and he's the creator of the Parkinson's Regeneration Training and Neuromotor Training Education Programs. Carl's extensive experience as a rehabilitation specialist includes working with a variety of populations. However, Carl primarily specializes in working with clients who have movement disorders such as Parkinson's disease, multiple system atrophy, MS, Charcot Marie Tooth, Alzheimer's, epilepsy, autism, and more. Carl is a leading educator in the movement disorder, human movement, and personal growth arenas. He is the chief operating officer of Agile Human Performance and owner and CEO of Neuro Motor Training LLC, which currently offer courses worldwide. In addition, Carl is the founder and president of the Parkinson's Global Project a nonprofit foundation dedicated to funding education and research and helping people with Parkinson's and other movement disorders all over the world. So without further ado, let's dive right into an episode that we can all benefit from, but it is also very important that you share this episode, I believe, with anyone you know that has a connection to someone or may be suffering from any kind of movement disorders. Let's go right in. Hello, Carl Sterling. I am so happy to have you back on the podcast. How are you? Doing really well, Dee, and it's really good to see you again, too. Thanks for having me back. Likewise. Uh, Today, we're actually going to be focused on intervention strategies for managing Parkinson's disease, but I bet uh, we're probably going to go beyond Parkinson's. Sure. Is that, can you Talk maybe about all humans? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, can we maybe start by talking about the different uh, types of intervention strategies? Sure. So first what I do is uh, like in your initial meeting, let's say with somebody. And of course the learning curve with each person keeps, cont- it continues over time to see how they react to different stimuli. But um, we learn the most, I learn the most up front, first couple of times especially. And what I'm really looking at is the end result, like where do they want to be? Okay, so a person comes in, where are you now? What do you struggle with? I have this whole questionnaire too, that it's my own version of a par Q, which is more like 60 questions. Mm -hmm. And, uh, find out you know what are your top struggles if if you will you know let's say could be getting out of bed could be walking freezing for somebody with parkinson's perhaps um maybe they've been falling you know so we just want to find out where they're at but even more so like where do they want to be what is their number one set of goals and then try to work backwards from there but typically what happens is, you know, it's usually something like, well, you know, I want to move better. 
I want to improve my gait, my posture, my arm swing. My uh, I want to gain strength. Maybe they want to gain muscle, uh, lose weight. It, everyone's different, right? But um, the bottom line is I put it all into like two really big categories. And uh, especially if we're dealing with movement disorders. And then under these two categories are subcategories and lots of them. Uh, one of the first one, I, I said, uh, I refer to it as bottom up training. Second one is top down training. So it's interesting because I didn't know this and I actually felt like I had my own idea sort of, but it's not a new concept because if you look at the work of, or the writings of John Rady at, um, professor at Harvard Medical School, Andrew Huberman at Stanford, and all these other geniuses out there, they talk about bottom up and top down. So if you want, I can kind of describe this bottom up thing. Yeah, I would love it. I like to start with bottom up. And here's what it is. Now, this really comes to me from my years teaching for a really amazing lady who used to be based in New York City. Now she's in Arizona the past few years with her family. Uh, Dr. Emily Splickle, I refer to, and I think she refers to herself as a functional podiatrist. She can take care of your bunion with surgery and she can do surgery, but she would rather not do surgery, not get, rather not give you supportive arch, supportive orthotics and have you build your own arch. But and, and improve your own foot posture. And I taught for her for years and I learned so much, learned so much from her. And this whole bottom up concept really starts with the skin on the bottom of the feet, right? The plantar skin is uh, statistically the most highly populated skin. I should say the most densely populated skin on the body with small nerve, sensory, and mechanoreceptors. And these nerves are directly connected through our nervous systems to our brain. So if we look at, let's say over the years, we're using, over the decades, we're maybe wearing shoes and socks all the time. You know, some people never go barefoot for whatever reason. Sometimes they just don't like it or they don't think it's good for them. Or God forbid, maybe somebody who they feel is an authority figure, like maybe even a podiatrist said, don't ever go barefoot. And I'm no doctor, but I can tell you most of the time, that's fake news. You probably want to go barefoot. I'm not sure what they would so say. They, so there are, there are doctors that would say that? Oh, yeah. My daughter's podiatrist, who is no longer her podiatrist, said, don't ever go barefoot. How interesting. Wow. How surprising. Yeah, totally ridiculous. And I think in those cases, to be fair to them a little bit, is that no, I don't mean to diss the community at all. We need our doctors and our experts, but um, they're looking more at the, let's say, the anatomical function or the biomechanics, not so much sensory input. Because a lot of people just bypass the whole sensory input factor of any kind of touch, you know, so palms are the second, statistically second most popular with small nerve, mechano, and uh, sensory receptors, right? We use our hands every day. Uh, but do we get on our bare feet every day on our plantar skin? Not usually. So what happens, though, is these nerves, they tend to go to sleep. You know, they're not dead. They're dormant, though. So that's because we've had some kind of cushion between the skin and the surface underneath us for so long the sole of the shoe, um, you know, that, that will just steal information, vibration forces that your body would benefit from receiving, but a portion of that goes away into the sole of the shoe. The thicker the sole, the more it uh, sucks out, sucks information. You get less input, less accurate input as to what's underneath you exactly. So, I mean, I could go down that road for two days and talk, but I'll spare you. Bottom line, though, is if you take somebody who's having some trouble with, let's say, well, let's just say stride symmetry. So their their gait is not very symmetrical. 
Uh, they maybe they have a shuffly step or something like that. Mm -hmm. If you do something as simple as get the shoes and socks off, have them walk around on whatever surface, you know, assuming that it's safe, you'll probably hear feedback from them that they feel more, they feel more sensation, and you'll probably observe different movement. Most of the time, it's wow. going to be improved. What we do here is uh, we'll do that, or usually we just have them get on this giant power plate we have. We have the very blessed and lucky to have the top end power plate. It's the the most incredible, best whole body vibration device known to mankind. And so we put them on that. And, you know, not only do we wake up their skin on the bottom of the feet, but their nervous systems, their brain. Yeah. Uh, a lot of times if they have neuropathy of any type or to any degree, that diminishes or oftentimes just goes away. And sometimes it's a permanent thing where it's just gone away. And sometimes it's just a temporary fix. But we can do so much in that in regards to stimulating input. Because if you think about it like this, if we kind of take this first thing here of the plantar skin, that, that's like our first go-to, let's stimulate your brain so you get more input. Because when you get more input, it will immediately send out a stronger, faster, better signal with output to help you stabilize better. Mm -hmm. And the, the thing that we find more than anything else with a barefoot stimulation portion of a session is that people feel more secure and more stable in their movement. And if they weren't feeling that secure or stable or they're really, uh, they have a fear of falling because maybe they fall, they're in the fall mm. risk, their fall risk is high for whatever reason. This can be a really simple game changer. It's like just so yeah. basic, right? So Absolutely. That's the first of the bottom-up category, if you will. But we're also working on the top. We are working, mm -hmm. stimulating the brain through the feet. I mean, absolutely, that's yeah, pretty cool. Mm -hmm. From there, um, you know, it depends upon the person, but we always want to be working on things that we need to be thinking about over the lifespan, or I'll say the health span. That seems to be the word I like these days because we can have a long lifespan without great health or or maybe a portion of life. Maybe it's towards the end of years. Like, sadly, my dad for many years was very sick before he passed. But um, so his spell, health span lasted a certain number of years. Then there's about six years of bad health, right? Right. Well, if we can, in, in, let's say, make our health span improve or increase our health span, so we live longer, we live healthier during the years that we have, all this, all this stuff that we work on is going to be geared towards that. I mean, basic things like strength. You know, so many people come in and, you know, I'm, I'm actually no exception. I'm 62, so... I'm not as strong as I used to be, although I'm stronger than I've been in probably 30 years. But, you know, when I was yeah, 30, yeah. I, I could have done a lot more and I did do a lot more in certain ways. I've been building it back up, but I have to maintain that. So I have to keep on working on my strength. It's the foundation for my movement, our movement, our balance. We, we need to keep enough muscle mass so we can be in control of our movement. And uh, also our bone density is another thing that can change over the years. And we do a lot with a uh, really, really cool machine here made by pretty much a partner of the same owners, actually, as power plate. It's called BioDensity. Mm -hmm. So I saw, I saw that you got super excited about that, and that yeah, got me all excited. We have people come in every day, man. And the doctor and I upstairs, we went in on this. and. So we have so much osteoporosis, osteopenia, osteoarthritis, right. for a number of reasons. A lot of times it seems to be more so postmenopausal women. Mm -hmm. um, just real simple there. A lot of times it just has to do with the hormonal changes. You would take somebody like my wife, for example, who had cancer 19 years ago, and she's 60 now. Well, the chemo pills and all those things you know, if somebody's had anybody, male, female, if they've had 
uh, cancers or there's certain medications, especially related to cancers and chemotherapies and this and that, that can really wreak havoc with your bones. So yes, we have this machine and it's very, very cool because you can load to the max safely. And, you know, maybe you do 300 pounds on a leg press, but you're doing 1200 on our biodensity effectively. Well, great. You're, you're building strength, you're building a little bit of muscle and you're triggering the body's own ability to build that soft bone tissue and increase, like improve your T-score, Z, Z-scores and build bone density. Um, but along with that, we don't want to replace uh, full range of motion, resistance training, or body weight things. We want the full range of motion. Our muscles need that. Absolutely. And that's where if you don't have access to biodensity or something like that. Well, circling way back now to bottom up, we talked about plantar skin, a simulation. Well, we'll just bottom up, we walk on our legs, not our hands usually so we want mm -hmm. to make sure we have a nice strong foundation and so strength will help us to maintain bone de density in other words you, you know how it is you build muscle and your bones can benefit and they will benefit Absolutely. so um balance um coordination rotations just Anything that the person will be doing during their day, activities day, of daily living, we want to work towards having the sensory input from beneath us to have us not have a better, let's say, awareness, proprioceptive and kinesthetic, maybe, of, of where we are in space. And then take it from there to, uh, you know, be working on the, the strength, which is foundation for movement balance things like that i could go on and on about that i i won't because the other thing we're doing is let's say top down training mm -hmm. so if you want i can just share a little bit about what i what i how i view that if you will yeah of course so none of this comes from me i'm not smart enough to make up any of this stuff but you know i love uh dr lisa lisa moratory let me talk about her for a minute Dr. Right. Lisa Moratori is, um, as far as I know, she's still at Stony Brook University on Long Island. And it's got to be 10, 11 years ago, we met up through a friend of mine in New York City, a uh, really great uh, NASM, uh, Rick Ritchie, so one who introduced me to her, Dr. Ritchie. So we um, we met up and she was talking about domains, not all of them, but some domains of cognition and memory. She says, you know, in Alzheimer's and dementia and cognitive decline and just always, we want to make sure that we can build and maintain our ability to stay sharp, to have good reaction time, to think quickly, to remember things. And if we practice it, we'll get better. But we also want to make sure that we can do a lot of this while we're moving. Because every time you think, you don't want to have to stop walking if you have to have a thought, I mean, it sounds ridiculous, right? Right. No, it's ama but, it's amazing. So now we'll go into different types of movements. Uh, it could be just walking. It could be walking up an infinity pattern, which I learned from Perry Nicholson. I don't know if you know Dr. Perry. Well, you got to no, have him on the show. Uh, oh, really? <laughs> yeah. He wrote the... Um, forward for my first book thank you dr perry um called parkinson's regeneration training which really could be just training for all humans um you know that whole thing about being able to multitask well you know there are studies in fact lisa mortori was she did a couple of these studies at stony brook where uh what does it look like when somebody's texting and walking? What are the statistics of falls and injuries? Well, definitely when we're, I, I, I've, I tripped over a bench once up at the university when I was texting and I'm walking yep. and I didn't see the bench. I went right over, you know? Right, right. That's, <laughs> I couldn't believe I did. We're, we're all guilty of that. We are all oh guilty gosh. of that. So just think about it multitasking and when you're looking at let's say a person or a population 
who's dealing with a neurodegeneration in the brain or the nervous systems. At some point, especially with Parkinson's, MSA, and certain other conditions or diagnosis, there's there's a you know a significant problem many times with being able to perform one task while doing the other. It, it could be as simple as they're walking across the room, their phone rings, it's on the other side of the room, and that distraction actually causes a freezing. It's like, whoa, I got to get my phone, and then they freeze up. And they're trying to turn to go get it. But if they, let's say their center of mass doesn't stop moving up here, right? Uh, the upper body, if that keeps on moving and their feet are frozen. Oh, boy. Yeah. And that's one of the things that, that happens to certain people anyways. Fall will happen because of a distraction, which caused them to freeze. They, maybe they wanted to rotate and they got stuck in the rotation and they, they go down. So we really need to be working on, I call it mindful movement, but I didn't make that one up either. That's from a book called The Brain That Changes Itself by Norman Doidge out of Toronto. When he was talking about John Pepper, who was diagnosed with Parkinson's in 1962, and this is 50, 61 years ago, and he, he's doing amazingly well in South Africa, probably in his 80s or beyond. Uh, we connected on LinkedIn recently, so I'm hoping to talk with him someday. But Pepper distinguished this mindful movement in his own life. And just we, we work on that here constantly with various, you know, various things. Sometimes we'll put dots on the floor as a trigger, let's say a visual stimuli to get the foot to go towards it if they have akinesia which is a temporary loss of voluntary movement. They know they want to go. They can't get that foot to step. And then they might trick themselves into it by thinking of a rhythm or thinking of something, and then boom, they go. Or visual stimuli. I have people who have tape on their floors at home, little squares of tape, because these are uh, like traffic areas where they oftentimes get caught up, and then when they're stuck, they just step on one of the dots, and it gets them going. Wow. I have to <clears> – <throat> the thing that I keep thinking about is how scary is it mm -hmm. when you keep going, but your, but your legs don't? Like, that's, that's just really um, – that really gets into my heart right there. So if you're saying that one thing that can help – is actually putting tape on the floor. That's huge. I mean, pe people need to know that that's an option and it's very affordable, you know, oh. and it's, you can do it at home. Yeah. Buy a roll of duct tape or exactly. painter's tape. Just put it on your floor. A little dot right. here, a little dot there. Your, your, um, let's say areas where you commonly get uh boggled up or, or you freeze have tape around so that you have a visual stimuli the reason it's kind of well important is because it's pretty interesting how when we look at parkinson's and msa and some other parkinson's like or let's say dopamine deficient type disorders there's dopamine in our retinas so a lot of times in parkinson's and other uh types of uh, diagnosis like that, that lack of dopamine causes depth perception issues and contrast challenges, if you will. So how that relates to getting stuck is I think it's not completely separated from it. It can be separated. The distraction of a phone ringing, let's say, or a person saying, hey, uh, D, come here. And you're caught off guard and you want to turn and go. That's one kind of distraction, but now you need to look in that direction of the person or the phone or wherever you want to go to. <laughs> and maybe the lack of dopamine in your retinas is causing a problem with determining how far away the person or the phone is, or maybe there's an obstacle in the way. We see it all the time where somebody's walking really, really well, and then they get to a doorway or a change of the surface in the floor from, you know, 
hardwood to carpet or whatever, or there's an obstacle in the way and it throws them off because visually they're not exactly sure how big this opening of the door is or where that surface change is exactly, or is there a step up or a drop down? And so it that can cause freezing. So doorways, um, a good place to have pieces of tape, visible cues, because somehow that seems to trigger and, and bypass, sort of anyways, bypass that, um, help to bypass the freezing, if you will. Not all the time. It, it doesn't, nothing works all the time for everybody. And in fact, sometimes it works great for somebody and certain days they're just having a bad day and it's just not working at all, you know, it's just, but it's just like balance, you know, yeah. uh, people with great balance have off days. There are so many factors that go into it. Absolutely. So, you know, when I talk about, uh, if we get really nerdy and into the science of this whole multitasking thing, what I'm really looking at D is taking a movement things on top of the movement so let's take something really really simple which doesn't necessarily mean easy we, we have a really cool brand new treadmill here from diaco medical rehab it goes forwards it goes backwards uphill downhill we have a big synaptic sensory screen we can wheel around to the back of it it's made to fit this treadmill and so we'll have people walking on the treadmill maybe backwards very slowly and then they're actually playing games on this 60 inch screen and they're so they're doing two things at once they're walking maybe right. uphill backwards even right right it's just on on a level surface forwards you know we have all safety precautions in place we're not going to let them get hurt or fall but that that's kind of an extreme thing though usually what we do is maybe have them uh sidestep through an agility ladder I have taped on the floor and maybe throw a ball, a ball with letters on it, for example. And so you got the hand-eye coordination thing happening with the ball. And we might pick a topic. You know, the, the ball I have has the whole alphabet on it. So uh, yesterday we did street names with a lady. She's going through the ladder, walking sideways, doing some cross foot patterns, doing a great job. Okay, you catch the ball. First letter you see, name a street around here that begins with that letter. Throw it back to me. I do it. We do these things, these things together a lot of times. It's good for me to do too, you know? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We do, absolutely. you know, sports or flowers or birds or geography or, uh, you know, names, women's names, men's names, whatever. So mm -hmm. we really try to get creative with adding something on top of or stacking something on top of our movement so that we can develop, if you will, those neural pathways that allow you and, and make it so that you can be good at doing these things. As the more we do it, the better we're going to get at it, just like anything, you know, and then if you don't mind a little shameful self-promotion, my book, um, both books actually talk about neuroplasticity, but this one has a chapter about it, Parkinson's Empowerment Training, and it's very, very specific on how you can intentionally create new neural pathways. This is not rocket science. It's actually way simpler than I thought it was scientifically, just that the, the work that it takes to do it, well, it's work. But if you keep doing it for a few minutes a day, you know, eventually you're going to be really good at throwing the ball, bouncing the ball back and forth. Um, I mean, we'll add more. No matter like, what age. Like, uh, oh, you can... absolutely. Like John Rady from Harvard says, till our dying day, as long as we're conscious, we can learn things. Yeah. So the brain will change itself. It will adapt to what you need it to, to some degree. And it, it what doesn't mean... We're ever going to get back to baseline where we were before diagnosis. Uh, but it's almost always we will improve if we put in the work. And sometimes we do get past baseline where we were, you know, with a di diagnosis or no diagnosis. Um, 
I just started work with we're working with a 98 year old lady last month, mm. right after our uh, our last conversation. And uh, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, she says I don't have a whole lot of years left. I don't think, but I really want to have a nice a nice health span. She knows the word. Says, she I got be it. Well, and I want to be strong. So you know, we're tossing things back and forth, and she's doing sit to stands while we're doing it or whatever. It's really the the big picture is this: when people walk out the door here, I want the benefits of what we do here to travel outside with them. Fortunately, thanks be to God and whoever is whatever is this that this stuff really works beautifully because people do come in and they say, "Oh my gosh, you know, I I almost fell, but I didn't fall. Oh, I remembered yeah. this." I didn't used to remember that because we do a lot with cognition and memory and reaction time. We really want that. And my, one of my favorite stories is a gentleman I've been working with for a couple of years. Two years ago, he was falling down about once per week. No injuries. Parkinson's for many years. Well, by the end of two years ago, it's hardly falling. Last year, no falls at all. So I said, wow, Carl, this stuff really works. Says, well, that's because you're working. You're well, doing yeah. it. You know, yeah, I'm, all I'm uh, doing is being your tour effort. guide. Yeah. I show you what to do. You put in the work. You're like, he's never missed a session. He comes in like clockwork. He's here. So I love that. You know, we got bottom up with a whole bunch of stuff. And then we got top down where we can really challenge the brain for reaction time, cognition, memory. And we could do all that while we're moving, you know, so why not work on cognition and memory and reaction time while we're moving? Yeah. It doesn't have to just be walking. It could be walking sideways, backwards, could be jumping through an agility ladder on a single leg if we're able to. We have people who can do that. Just really try to overload them safely. Right. Don't let them get hurt. We want them to feel fatigue. Because that's actually a set of neurochemicals that comes about made by the brain when you're fatigued. That is, ex- they're extremely healthy for the brain. Mm-hmm. And they help mm-hmm. with neuroplasticity, especially while you're sleeping. So, yeah, I mean, DX, you know me. I could talk forever about it because I love I it. I know. And, those are my two know, biggest categories. And I also know that um, you fit me in to your very, very busy schedule this morning. <laughs> And um, I just want to say that um, you really challenged me right now because, um, you know, I talk about mindfulness a lot and I've got workshops on it and it's, yeah. it's something that I'm very, very passionate about. And uh, I very often will, will talk to people about how there is no such thing as multitasking. And um and I'm usually talking about the fact that, you know, you're, you can't have your phone next to you and write uh, an MBA paper. Um, oh, well, but on the other hand, you're also telling me about this stacking. And um, so I should, I, I feel like now I'm going to change it where it's like, there's no such thing as really multitasking when you do have to focus because your brain is going to focus on it's going to go it's going to ping pong yeah but the stacking is a kind of a form of it it really is and um and it's an amazing form and we should all be doing it well let me add on to that because that's that's um actually what you what you just said technically is is exactly the same and is correct about not being able to multitask we have to like qualify and clarify what, what are we talking about? I have notes from Dr. Moratori in our meetings that we've had over the years, where she says, just what you said, your brain is going to ping pong because your brain does, it has to ping pong. So here's what we try to do. We'll try to get somebody, let's just use one example. They're stepping over these little five inch hurdles, sideways doing cross foot patterns. Okay, going through our facility, playing catch with the letter ball. We'll use that as the example. Maybe our topic is flowers, whatever. (laughs) doesn't matter. You'll see that when the person catches the ball and 
first of all, that alone might make them stop. So they're not moving anymore. Then when they come up with, uh, let's say, a response, they throw the ball and they start moving. So what we're trying to do and we cue constantly is, okay, you're doing a fantastic job, but try to keep moving even while you're stuck thinking of an answer. So I don't know how to clear, I don't know how to define this. Is is this multitasking exactly? I think it is because you are moving and you are thinking, and maybe you're even throwing the ball back to me, but you're still toggling back and forth because that's right. how the brain works. And like Lisa right. said, you <laughs> you can decide to do one thing at a time and toggle back and forth. And it might be really fast, like constantly. Okay, here I'm going to do this. Okay, I got to do that. Okay, now this, and then back and. But can you? How 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 efficiently can you do all these three things at the same time mm -hmm. with the least amount of toggling? I don't know if there's really an answer other other than when I get my uh, portable EEG in here and we start measuring brain activity during this, it probably won't give us an answer. But it sure be real interesting to look at. So don't, you know, don't stray from what you're saying about mindfulness, because you are totally correct, man. I, no, I'm not, I'm not. I just really... finished writing a third mm -hmm. book, and I finished it in about a day. Oh, did uh, you finish? Yeah. Did I tell you about that one? You told me that you were writing. No, I'll send it to you in an email what it is, and uh, I, it's almost ready for the market. I would but love yeah, it. I mean, I I had to have the phone away and all that stuff. I couldn't finish that book. I did it while course, I was no, really because really our because our mind is like um, a movie. What a movie is, it looks like it's just a flow, but it's picture, 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 and it's very, very fast. So uh, we really are um, unitaskers. We're not multitaskers. Um, but it's it's interesting because what you and Moratori are saying is basically it's it's a matter of how fast. You can move from one thing to another physically in order to keep yourself safe also. So like, can you react while you're walking and, yeah. um, and how fast can, can your, can the ping pong be for you? I know you have to go. I so, do. Um, so however, we are going to continue our, our journey together. I, I love that. I love talking with you. I love all the great work you're doing. It's such a great, great um, everything you do is just top shelf. You have great Thanks. guests. You ask great questions. You're doing a lot to help people out there. And I'll just, uh, I'll leave on this note. When you think about this whole idea of multitasking, you know, you're walking through the grocery store, you're looking for a something. You're looking for a, a can of something, maybe. I don't know. You're looking for an item. And somebody bumps into you, you don't see them coming. You're still, you were looking for the item and you were moving, but you were moving like subconsciously because you're able to move. We're not thinking about, if we had to think about every step we take every day, wouldn't that be like crazy? It would be horrible because it would be exhausting. We'd never be able to think, yeah, we'd be tired all the time because we're thinking about every step. So this should be happening on a subconscious level so that allows us to focus on the task at hand of looking for the item or where's the checkout lane, you know, right. I'm moving. I don't want to have to stop and figure it out. I know I want to move and figure it out, but then you get hit. That needs to be a subconscious reactive thing within your brain that was built that causes you to react to a cross foot pattern, do whatever it is you have to do so that you subconsciously, reactively, reflexive stability, let's say that kicks in and you stay upright instead of falling down. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting. I, I could talk for hours about it. But yeah, uh, but yeah, I, yeah, so those are things that I like to think about and work on is just making everything as smooth as possible and try to make quality of life better and for all people because God only knows humanity needs that. Yep. We need people like you. That's what we need. Uh, right back at you. Carl <laughs> Sperling, thank, you, thank so, you so, so much. Your information and sharing it, it is so valuable. 
and uh, and also what you're doing in this world is so so valuable. And thank you, thank you, thank you. Really, I'm so grateful. Well, bless you, my friend. Safe travels, and uh, let's stay in touch. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks again Enjoy for your time today. Time.